the beginning of the month, I don't know when the 40 days started, sometime beginning of September, um, something um, happened that has, has changed the whole trajectory of my life recently. Now, I have been honest with you this year, as I've shared throughout the year, that this has been one of the toughest years I think I've ever known. And it's, it's certainly up there in the top three anyway. And I normally have a good year, so it's very unusual, but this year has been tough. And I've shared that with you as I've gone through this year. And Luke, I said, I'd be glad to see this year out because I know it's going to turn for good. And Luke yeah. said, well, you might not have to wait till the end of the year because God's calendar is September. He goes by the Hebrew calendar, not the Gregorian one. So he said, why don't you go by God's calendar? And he said, prepare like, prepare the 40 days before Rosh Hashanah. And you might, so I was like, anything to get out this year. Yes, I will. So I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew it was a 40-day covenant with God to seek him in a way that we haven't, I haven't sought him this year. And so um, I thought, oh, all I'm going to do is I'm going to sit like I normally do. I have a chair in my bedroom. I sit in my chair generally when I have time with God and I sit there and he either speaks to me through the word or, you know, through the spirit in my mind. I, you know, I get a word and I write it down. And it's been very quiet this year because it's been quite a tumultuous year for me. So I haven't heard God like I normally do. So when we started this 40 days, I had no idea what was going to happen. I really didn't. I had no agenda. The last thing in my mind was Jesus' return. The last thing that was not on my mind at all. I hadn't heard anyone talk about it, share about it. So I'm just giving you a preempt. So I had no idea that what was going to happen in the next three days of my life and that it was going to tie in with these past these three weeks that have just happened with Steve because I had what's called a visitation now. I've had them probably the number of times on my hand. Haven't had many. I hear from God. I don't really need those sort of things. But obviously God thought I did because I sat there and for three days, when I say visitation, I knew that the Lord came into my bedroom and it wasn't like me reading or sitting there listening to me. So I'm going to share them with you. So hold on. If any of you are squeamish, you might want to go now. <laughs> We're talking about the Lord's return, aren't we? And Jesus yeah. said, encourage each other with these That's right. uh, words. I'm coming back soon. Encourage each other so we won't lose hope, that we won't, that we'll be ready. Sorry. And so just wanted to put the backdrop that it ties in exactly those three days with these three titles. So God prepared me, prepared the, preparing the church for what he's saying. So it's very encouraging. And so the first day, and I'm going to be very kind. I'm not, I could speak an hour on each one of these, but I'm just going to give you a bite size of, of what he shared so that you can get a taste of what I feel God's saying. Now, I feel like he's not saying this. I thought he was saying this to me, but I believe since that he's talking to his church, not this church, but the church. And so remember, Jesus came, he's come, this is fact, Jesus came into the world as our saviour, he came as a man to experience what we feel, what we go through, and he died as a man, and he died as a lamb going to the slaughter. That's what his purpose was, to come as the lamb to take away the sin of the world. He fulfilled that. But, fact, Jesus is coming back again. And I believe very soon. And he's not coming back as a man. He's not coming back as a lamb. He's coming back as king. That's right. And yeah. he's coming back as a lion. And he, you'll hear him roar through the atmosphere. When he returns, the whole world will hear that roar. He's not, he's coming back, remember, on a white horse, and he's going to have tattooed on his thigh, faithful and true. He's faithful to his word, he's true to his word, he's true to everything that he's said to us. That's how he's coming back. So, where are we? So day one, I sit down, as usual, have my quiet time with the Lord. It wasn't very quiet. I was aware the Holy Spirit comes into my bedroom and I hear this voice say, Pauline, you've left your first love. So I'm like, okay. Um, 
where are we going with this God? And he took me to the Ephesian church. And he said how the Ephesian church in Revelation had it all. They had been really on fire for God. They had responded to the gospel. And now, a number of years on, they were going through the motions. And he said, this is how I see you this year. You've been on fire for me. You've loved me. You've lived for me 100% passion. Everything you did was, you know, get up in the morning. Let's do this for Jesus. He said, but somehow you've got into the, that Ephesian church syndrome where you're, you're going through the motions. You st- the church looked great. On the outside, you would have gone in there and thought nothing's changed. And he said, you're doing really well, church. But he said, the only thing I've got against you, you've, you've lost your first love for me. Where's that love that we had when you first came to me? When I was everything to you, where where is it? He said, on the outside, you might be looking the same. But on the inside, I know that somewhere you've drifted. I don't think many people, I've been in church a long time, and I've seen people come and go from church. I don't think, in all honesty, many people leave Jesus. But I do believe a lot of us drift. Drift, and this is. I'm just going to give you a nugget of what he shared because I can't go into all these things. But he said, Pauline, three things remember, remember your first love. What were you like? I was off the chance. If you think I'm bad now, when I become a Christian, people are saying, Please shut up, Pauline. We can't take any more of your Jesus, Jesus, Jesus at bus stops, you know. My whole family, I wrote to all my family, whether they were Freemasons or what, offended lots of them. Jesus is amazing. He's alive. He's real. Believe him or you're going to hell. You know, this was me. Wrote to everybody. Spoke to everyone at bus stops, on the buses. And this was me. I couldn't stop. I just couldn't. Went straight off to Bible college. Wanted to tell the whole world, where's that? I tell you, I'll be honest. I go out with Luke. He loves God. He, he'll go up to anybody and share the good news. Jerry's the same. We've been out, outreach with Jenny. For me... I've got to a place where I've had to force myself. What's that about? Mm-hmm. Jesus is supposed to be everything to me. And I'm doing it, but I'm doing it in, through the motions. That's what he was saying to me. Pauline, you didn't have anybody. You went out on your own mm-hmm. with that love for me. Mm-hmm. Nobody had to invite you out. He said, remember, repent and return to me. Mm-hmm. Pauline, just acknowledge it, that you've come along my way this year away from me and come back return to me and I'll return to you and um and it was funny because I kept thinking it keeps it kept saying return return and I saw over the 40 days a big that in big letters return and I had no idea that this 40 days prelude to Rosh Hashanah means return that's what the Jews do it's their time of returning to God I had no idea but God showed it to me on that first day of that first visitation return and he wants me to use this time to return to him to the first love and then he said there are many things that cause us to drift and these are three things I will give you a list and he said I've looked over my life and these are three things that caused me to drift over the nearly 50 years well actually it's 50 I just didn't want to own up to it of of walking with Jesus and one is busyness we just get caught up in the things of life. Busy, busy, take the kids to school, get to work, get to the bank, do the dirt, do dinner, plan, plan. And busyness causes us to drift away from our time with God. And then the fire starts going down. Oh, we can't attend church so much because this week I've got to do this with the kids or take them here. And we just drift. And I've had that. And I don't like it because Fire goes down, doesn't it? Boredom. I've been there. I was 10 years a Christian, did everything Jesus asked me to, and I was totally bored with church, totally bored with God because I was not seeing breakthrough in so many areas I've been praying for for years. And so I had a choice. I went to the pastor's wife and I said, I'm bored, I'm frightened, I'm going to come away, fall away from church. Not God, just church. So we decided to meet and seek God. The pastor and I, pastor's wife, not the pastor. And, uh, and at the end of seeking God for a year, 
I was filled and baptised with the power of God. It changed my life, took us away onto mission, then took me into a hub, another place. I've shared it with you before. Brokenness and bitterness, when you get broken in church. Yeah. And believe me, if you've been around church long enough, you're likely to get broken. I got broken in church, got very bitter for a whole year. I came to church. It wasn't this church, unfortunately. But I didn't want anything to do with church people. I didn't talk to them. Um, I didn't want to pray for them. I didn't care. I just had a whole year of so broken. But then God said at the end of the year, he, he came to me at 2.30 in the morning. I was asleep. He woke me up. And I saw an arm. And it had a stick in. And he went. And he drew a line. Right. Went like this. This arm did along my bed. And he said, uh, Pauline, I've drawn a line. And if you carry on like you are, hey, I can't. I'm going to have to let you go. That's what he said. And I knew he didn't mean salvation. I knew he meant my fellowship with him was going to be different because I'd probably have a, I don't know, breakdown or something. I don't know, you know, because I was getting so bitter. So that night, I came back to God. Would you believe it? The fear of God, honestly, in me in my room. So the next morning, I couldn't wait to get up. And I started to phone friends and repent that I wouldn't let them help me, that I'd, you know, cut everybody off. And, and do you know what? By the time 48 hours had gone, I was in a revival, a personal revival. And God came and met with me after the repentance and started a completely different ministry. So it isn't about getting broken and bitter. It's about letting God deal with it. Going back to God, letting him heal you. I wouldn't let him heal me. I just wanted to sit and wallow in it. <laughs> let him heal you. And so that was um, that was the first visitation, believe it or not. I could go on more about that. The second day he came, again, completely not expecting anything else, thinking I've got to get my life back on track. And he came in with this. But it was actually a big, steamy, fresh loaf of bread. This isn't very... I think this is cheese. Oh, my goodness. And so he came in with a loaf of bread. I was like, what's that? He said, it's fresh bread. It's what you haven't had for a long time. He said, and he gave me the John 6. He spoke to me about John 6, where he said, I'm the bread of life. Yeah. And we need him. You see, we're not just a body. You, you'll all fill yourself with some kind of food because otherwise you're going to die today or feel hungry. But what he said was, our souls need nourishing. Yeah, that's right. We have got a spirit man in us. And Steve showed these pictures of like people that were fit, somebody that was fit and somebody that wasn't. But I tell you, you all look healthy on the outside. You all look fit. None of you look like, you know, you're going to fall over and kill over any time. But if we could see your spirit, what does your spirit man look like? Is it like Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> or is it some weak, skinny little thing that's never been nourished with Jesus this year? And he said, he said from Isaiah 54, why are you spending so much time working, toiling for everything that doesn't satisfy you? You're spending so much time worrying about this and that when you could come to me, eat me, the true bread, and I'll satisfy every longing of your heart. So you're on the internet, you're seeking what foods would do me good, what's this doctor saying, what's that doctor saying, what's this minister saying, what's that doing? We're going, we're Googling everything. He's like, why don't you come and eat of me and all that will be sorted out? Because I'm the only one who's going to satisfy your soul. Amen. Come on. There isn't a person alive that can satisfy you, not your husband, not your wife, not your kids. Seriously. And if you think they will, try it. But God will let, purposely let them let you down so that you eat of him. And he says in Isaiah, now, listen, I believe we're on the, on the, honestly, on the threshold of one of two things or both. Revival, Jesus' return, or both. I believe he wants both. That's personally what I feel he's been saying. Amen, bring up. But for that, this has to precede that. These verses that he gave me on three visitations are all what he's given me before revival's broken out, before that I've been involved in. They've all been given before. So I know this is a prelude to what God wants to do to the church right now. 
He wants to refire us in such a way that he needs to refine us first before the fire of God can hit us. The fire of God has to refine us and bring us to a place of repentance, of making him first again in the church. Not coming to church because your friends do or because it's a good lunch or because it, you think it fits a religious bill and you can tick your box off. Yeah. He wants you to come here because you're burning yeah. with a desire to get to the King of Kings because one day very soon you won't have that choice. Yeah. One day very soon he's going to appear or he's going to take us in the rapture, whatever you believe. I'm not here for a theological debate. But I'm here to say he's coming back so soon. Are we ready? Steve prayed this morning. He sang it. He said, Lord, we're waiting. We're waiting. It's not the waiting. It's how are we waiting? Are we waiting in Asda on a Sunday morning or shopping? Or are we waiting in church absolutely on our knees? Can't wait. Yeah. Do you know the Christian church? We've seen it. We, we, you know, when we were in Asia, we saw secret tapes of the Chinese church. They're on their knees, hours and hours, crying out, Jesus, come back soon. We love you. We can't wait. They're being persecuted, and the love they have for him is so intense. They're crying, they're weeping. They don't care if they get taken away that afternoon. Was, I've been there. Dave and I have been to China. It was, yeah, I won't go there anyway, but it's scary. I didn't want to live there. But Anyway, so what Jesus said was in Isaiah 55, um, what did he say? He said, come to me. Why are you spending money on that which is not bread and you're working for that which doesn't even satisfy you at the end of the day? Come and buy of me wine and milk without money. And he said, if you will cry out, if you will cry out um, for me, That's what he said, to, I'm trying to get the actual verse, seek the Lord while he may be found. There's going to come a day you won't have a choice. And this is all I'm saying. That I won't. Remember, this isn't, this isn't getting at you. This is what God's downloaded to me. Can you imagine how I felt in my bedroom? Like, ground, open me up. But seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. What does it mean to call upon him? He said, cry out to me like a baby cries out when they want milk or when they want to move from milk to real food. How many of you cry out that I want more of you, Jesus? I want more of you. I see so much more in the Bible that I haven't got in my life. Now, if you want to know, I've always, up until last week, always thought that first meant cry out like a baby. <laughs> I want milk. <laughs> no. If anyone was in Primark last Wednesday, God showed me a perfect illustration. A newborn baby cried out for his milk and it filled the whole of the level of Primark. It was loud, it was deafening, it was very demanding. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's a new baby. Fancy bringing a newborn into Primark, that poor mother. So I went looking because I couldn't stand it was so loud. You think a little baby can't make that much noise? Yes, it can. So I went looking to think somebody needs help. So I go and I find this mother and the mother and obviously the grandmother, they look very similar, are trying to do something with this newborn baby. And this <laughs> really, really loud. And so next minute I see and I realise what they're trying to do. They're trying to feed the baby in the middle of Primark. And she breastfeeds, so it's tricky. So she's trying to do it without showing anyone, so she manages. So she's got a baby in, like this, jacket over her, and she's walking around feeding this baby in Primark to stop it screaming. And so I went up and I said, look, there's a chair over there. Would you like a chair? She went, no, it's all right. I think she meant the baby wants to stand, you know? <laughs> and so she's walking around Primark feeding this baby. <laughs> And God said, there you go. That's the cry I want to hear. I want you to be uninhibited, not self-conscious when you cry out to me. That baby does not care about anything but give me more milk or I'm going to die. That's the cry he means here. Now, you might think, oh, no, that's not really respectable in church. We have been in moves of God 
And when God moves, people start crying out like that. They don't care about you sitting next to them. They don't care what it sounds like. It's just something in their spirit. Oh, my God, I need you. Oh, my God, if you don't do something in my life, nobody else is going to do it. It's a cry from your heart that you do not care who's listening. And that's why he says, cry like a baby. (laughs) It's not that, "Mm -hmm -hmm." babies don't cry like that, do they? (laughs) The neighbours can hear. You're not on the planes. How many times do you see on the shorts, the baby's on the plane crying and all the plane's going, can I shut that baby up? (laughs) You know? So that's number two visitation. That's the nugget. Are you in for number three? Yeah. Um, anyone, anyone left the building yet? No. Okay, so number three. And um, this is where this ties in with today because it is, again, it is a parable that is on the last days. And st- st- when Steve asked me to do the healing, I said to him, do you know, I'd love to do the return of Jesus. I wouldn't have done either of these if I hadn't had these visitations because God spoke on them and already forewarned me to so in Matthew 25, I don't know if you know this story of the wise virgins, and I'll give a disclaimer now. I have never preached on this because I've never understood it. It's always bothered me. I don't really like it. So this is a first. So at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. I actually ordered a lamp from Israel and it hasn't come. And, um, and five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but they didn't take any extra oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars with their lamps, and the bridegroom was a long time coming. So they all got drowsy, and they all started falling asleep, thinking, oh, and I don't know when he's going to come. But at midnight, and that's, again, it's a parable of the end times, and it's, I believe we're at midnight now. I don't know how it's going to get worse. Um, and before Jesus comes back, and at midnight, a cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Quick, there's ten bridesmaids. Come out, meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, because otherwise ours is running out. It's going low. We'll not have enough. And they were like, no, we can't give you ours if we give you ours then we won't have enough when the bridegroom comes. So he's like, no, I can't do that, sorry. So they left, they said, go and buy your own oil. Go down to the shop, go down, you know, Tesco, wherever, buy your own oil, but we can't give you ours. So the five foolish ones run off to buy their oil, okay? And while they were gone, the bridegroom arrived and they came back and And the virgins who were ready went into the wedding banquet uh, with the bridegroom and the door was shut. And later the others came, Lord, Lord, open the door, open the door for us. But he said, truly, I, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour Jesus is coming back for you. Now, I'm going to quickly explain Two, uh, two um, theories on this, because it is a very tricky parable to interpret. Now, some scholars say on the one camp, they say, oh, it's easy. It's the Christians and the non-Christians. And the non-Christians, even those in church who are not Christians, they won't be let in. Remember the door in Noah, just before judgment, was shut. God shut the door. No, I didn't. No man's going to shut the door on you. Only God. So the door was shut in both places by God. Now, if if it's just Christians and non-Christians, that's easy. Great. But the fact is, this parable talks about all of them having a lamp and all of them having oil, which is always, throughout Scripture, represents, as you know, the Holy Spirit. So it gets very tricky, doesn't it, this parable? And this has been debated for years. But this is what happened to me, and this is what has changed a lot for me. 
The third visitation on the third day, Jesus came in, and I know it was the Holy Spirit coming in the room. I just sat there, and then I saw Jesus. He was like up there, but he had a great big jaw bigger than this. That doesn't look safe, does it? No. And he said, Pauline, I'm filling your lamp with oil. And he just started pouring out this great big oil bottle. And I'm like, okay. And he said, I'm filling your lamp with oil. Now, remember, I don't like this parable. I've never thought about it in depth. I have thought about it in depth, but I can't work it out. So, so I was left reading from that because two things. One, I know that parables before Jesus comes back. It's a parable of the end times. Two, I think I've always put myself in the camp where I've got extra oil. <laughs> but obviously I wasn't in that camp because I needed it. And he said to me, this is what the 40 days is all about. Filling your lamp with oil. And then he went, and I've not had anything since. Great, eh? Three things in the whole year. This day and leaves me with that. You see, I thought, okay, God said, return to me and I'll return to you. If you're blaming me that I've gone somewhere and I need to return, you've obviously gone somewhere as well because you're going to return to me. So I don't know where you've been, God. But two, I didn't know that my lamp wasn't filled with oil. <laughs> I could have told you that from the, it's been a hard year, but all I'm doing is I'm leaving you with the same <laughs> question mark that I had. Mm, what if, what if, all I can tell you is I've suddenly come back to my first love. Can you imagine since that visitation? I, I keep saying to the family, my, my walk with Jesus has gone from 0 to 60 because of these visitations. That I can't tell you. It's transformed everything in my life. And I have had the toughest year up until there, where I was, I'd say I was surviving. And now, since that day, I'm on a mission. A mission to let people know he's coming back soon. And we've got to be ready. Don't let the things of this world take us out. And he wants us to seek him in this time while he can be found. A cry has gone out. A cry is going out in the spirit right now for those who want to hear it. Wake up. The bridegroom's coming. The bridegroom's coming. I don't, I'm not saying that this is Christians and Christians. I know what I'm beginning to believe since this time of Jesus. And I've seen scriptures in a way I've never seen them ever before. But I won't go into that now. But that I do believe that Jesus wants us to use this time to get back to our first love. He says, come and buy. Well, what does that even mean? The Holy Spirit is given to you as a free gift. You were saved as a free gift. You were baptized in the Spirit as a free gift. But it will cost you something to walk in the anointing of God. And the oil represents the anointing of God. Yeah. It will cost you something. It will cost you time. It will cost you. For me to get the anointing oil from God, to have ministered this last, certainly 30, 30 years I've been in ministry outside of like the local church, for that, it's cost me a lot in my time, in my social life, in my family life. There have been countless hundreds and hundreds probably thousands of times that I've wanted to do something other than go into the secret place with God. I've wanted to go out shopping. I've wanted to go for meals with my family. I've wanted to, I, I've wanted to do anything but go into that place where it starts off so lonely, where it's just you and you shut the door and you don't know if God's in. The, sometimes there is nothing. I can be out of nothing. You don't feel God's even bothered to meet with you. But then... On his terms, he will come and he will. you will have an encounter that changes your life radically, changes your family, changes your finances, changes everything about you. And it's all come out of the secret place of his presence. 
and that is what's made the difference. I have run back there. I don't know where else you will get the oil other than that place. There is no other place. I do believe come to church, but I believe we can't go through the motions. It's got to be real. It's got to go, come out of where we've been in the week. He's got to have first place. When he comes back, seriously, if you had two kids and you gave them all everything and one of them honoured you, thanked you all the time, you're such a good parent, you're so good, and the other one completely ignored you, never did one thing for you, how would you respond if you went away and you come back and thought, I want to treat them? We're natural. Or everything that's in us comes from God. We're made in the image of God. You wouldn't feel the same about them. I'm telling you, I don't think anyone's that godly. <laughs> You'd want to treat one more than the other, wouldn't you? If you knew one was just loved you, was thankful, was honouring you, and the other one never did any of that. That's how, I think that's how Father must feel when he comes back. Well, where were you? Were you in church or... Nah, no, I took that day off. I wasn't up to it that day. You know, and I can't, can't be bothered. I mean, I'm talking to me. He's talking to me now, remember. This is my challenge. And, and the times that I've missed opportunities this year that I knew that God gave me and I didn't take. But I know that when he's first in my life, I'm like that baby. I'm not self-conscious. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care. I just want God. And I know because people used to say about me, they, you know, years ago, Pauline, she, oh, she wants Jesus, Jesus. That's all you hear with Jesus. You know, that was even as like a married woman. They said she's so hungry. All she ever wants is Jesus. And, and I think would people say that about me this year? Probably not up until now. Maybe a, a change. But anyway, I want to pray for you. I just want... I believe that we're on the threshold of a massive, massive move of God. And that, as I say, whether we see that revival before he comes back or he just comes back, we've got to be ready for either. That's what I believe. And, and, not, and, and not be fooling around. You, we all look good to each other. I couldn't tell you, really, from the outside, what your heart's, who Jesus is first. I, I think you're all look great but you might have thought I look great and I wasn't <laughs> so who, know, who knows but um, let's just ask God and I just I just believe God wants to fill his church at this time with that oil so we're ready and I'm just going to pray